Thank you for joining us for this Aloha Shorts Literary Reading. It's my pleasure to introduce Sammy Choi. Sammy Choi was a co-producer of the Hawaii public radio show Aloha Shorts and a co-editor of the anthology The Best of Aloha Shorts. She is a theater director working primarily with the Hawaii Ponoi Coalition to present theater pieces about the history of Hawaii. She is currently working on the development of a theatrical presentation comparing the U.S. Constitution with the constitutions of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Currently, she teaches theater at Kapiolani Community College. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, and aloha. And mahalo to Professor Ann Inoshita for hosting the Best of Aloha Shorts. We would also like to recognize the Hawaii Council for the Humanities for their generous support of this event. The HCH is funding our tour of all Oahu community colleges and UH West Oahu. We could not do this without them. So first, a little background. Aloha Shorts was a radio show broadcast by Hawaii Public Radio. Started in 2004, and Craig Howes, Phyllis Look, and I took over co-producer duties in 2008. Each week, the station would broadcast Hawaii literature recorded by Hawaii actors in front of a live studio audience. These recordings took place once a month at HPR. We chose the pieces to fit particular themes, and then we cast actors we knew would perform those short stories and poems well. Some of the themes were women, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, food, Hawaiian writers, or sometimes a new Bamboo Ridge publication. Almost all the pieces came from Bamboo Ridge Press, which has been publishing in Hawaii for over 40 years. Their archives provided an incredibly wide variety of material for our almost four years of producing Aloha Shorts. Producing a radio show, a weekly radio show, involves a lot of preparation, but the main focus for us was the performances. We knew we had good texts and we knew good actors, but what made Aloha Shorts different was the care we took to have the pieces performed rather than just read. We three producers all have theater backgrounds and experience, so we wanted to explore how literature, as compared to plays, could be theatricalized as performance. Our last show was taped on May 6, 2012. Those shows were aired that summer. HPR then broadcast encore performances each week until March 26, 2013. In 2014, however, we were brought back to create and produce two one-hour shows for HPR, and those were broadcast in 2015. Another date. In 2017, Bamboo Ridge proposed that we edit a collection of the best of our years producing Aloha Shorts. And this is the result, your textbook. The anthology was published last year, and we launched it at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival last summer. Since then, we've had a sold-out evening of performances at Windward Community College's Paliku Theater last year, and a well-attended tour of the Big Island, Maui, and Kauai this spring. And we're very happy to be here at LCC to share the best of Aloha Shorts. In this first piece, a short story, along with the narrator, we witness the last hours before her home is covered by a lava flow. This is Lava Watch by Marjorie Sinclair, and it's read by Nyla Fuji-Ibab. The lava began to flow seven years ago, and everybody talked about it. An appearance of Pele, her will, her power, no one thought to mention the danger to our village, huddled under the green in the fragrances near the sea's edge. Our village, so old, no one had heard when it began. Pele was, well, Pele, dictatorial, implacable. We listened to surf, not lava. My whole body, however, quivered with that plume of smoke up on the mountain and the red night flares. I smelt the lava seven years ago, a light 
sulfur odor mingled with faint fumes of burnt earth and burnt leaves. People said I was crazy. They said, you couldn't smell lava, those things so far down the mountain slope and especially so near the sea. Through the years, the lava moved on with a leisurely insistence. It had a secret pace. Who could tell what was going to be, how far the molten rock would travel? Only Pele. Goddesses seldom reveal their thoughts. Their moods speak only at moments of action, unless they are in a prophetic mood. Pele was a goddess of action, a sudden appearance clothed in fire. On the mountain slope, the lava has left a huge, irregular trail of darkness, a trail of the burned and engulfed. People have moved from their burned homes, hunting new lives wherever they can find them. Now the lava is at the village, relentlessly moving as if it had all the time in the world its huge curling paws touching into flame everything in their way. During those seven years, I passed my 70th birthday and two of my daughters left their husbands and moved back home. I reared a grandson who called my house home whenever he was there. Samuel was a rascal boy, full of city ways. I wanted to give him the old country ways. He was always restless. He wouldn't stay. He was like a bird. The lava brought him back for a while, and he hiked through the woods to where he could see it, sometimes camping for several days. Of course, he wasn't supposed to do that, but he was an expert at escaping notice. I finally decided I mustn't worry about him or even ask him where he went. I guess I can't blame him too much for his mercurial behavior. My parents thought I was that way when I was young. After all, I had disappeared into California for a while. I wish I could be there now, flitting from place to place, but I'm stuck here, sitting around with old age, with the girls Pi'ilani and Harriet, and the lava has almost reached my back door. Pi'ilani was impatient with her mother's attitude toward the coming of the lava. Mom, didn't you want to do anything? Couldn't she see the inevitable? Couldn't she feel it in her bones? She simply drifted serenely from day to day, acting as if the lava moving down the mountain were a stream of water. She watched the houses burn. Afterwards, she embraced her old friends, her neighbors, and cried with them. She even gave them shelter for a night or two. She was, however, tranquil and steadfast, and she wouldn't allow anyone to remove her things from the house. The time has not come, she said. Yet the lava was almost up to the old stone wall great-grandpa had built long ago. The pond in the backyard had turned brown and seemed almost to be boiling. The water heaved. Mud churned from the bottom. Look, Mom, your pond is turning into lava, Pi'ilani said. Red anger was in her face. It's time, for God's sake, it's time. Keahi looked beyond her daughter at the stark lava softened by the green foliage of the plumeria and the hau tree. At some moment, the leaves and fronds would burst into torches. She was sure the trees knew that by now. Just as her father and grandfather in their graves in the side yard knew, 
grandfather always said, Pele gives and Pele takes away. Harriet, the younger daughter, embraced her. Mom, you're a little confused. I don't blame you. Why don't you let P.E. and me take charge? Keahi returned her embrace, then broke away from Harriet's arms. She had her plans, very simple ones, but she wouldn't tell her children until the first paw of lava touched the house. Maybe not even then, <laughs> if she could manage. I'll go inside now if you want and look things over. She saw the brightening in her daughter's faces. It made her sad. Some things I leave, the junk things. In the living room, she touched the pieces of old koa furniture. She laid her hands on the big table, which had been polished by three generations. It was silky to the touch. She picked up one of the poi pounders from the shelf and saw, as she had so many times, her grandfather sitting in the backyard, pounding poi on the big board. He had thin legs, a little pot belly, and a head of thick white hair. She always thought it looked like sea foam. Long ago, the board had disappeared. Now Poi came from the market. She smiled slightly. Change, change in everything, people, plants, even the shape of the mountain oozing. Only the lava remained, pouring from craters and vents as it made its slow passage, the trail of Pele down the mountain. <sighs> She went to her bedroom and lay down. These days, she was often tired, especially since the lava had come close. It was the unhurried pace of everything, the uncertainty, and she had to admit it, the anxiety. She hated anxiety. She knew exactly what would happen. When? That was what she asked, as her heart beat irregularly and her breathing was heavy. She felt as if the lava were pulsing in her, a part of her. Sometimes she wanted to be a part of it, treading slowly, stretching, breaking into red coals and flame, a moment of celebration. Afterwards, always a black collapse, a dark settling down. Hey, Mom, Mr. Lee is here. Tommy Lee was from civil defense. He had spindly legs like Grandpa and teeth too big for his face. He was a good man, very sympathetic, very tough, very fair. He walked into her room. Hello, Tommy. Want something to drink? No, thanks. I came to see if you have made plans. I figure another 48 hours. Mm, you usually figure right. Thanks, Keahi. I ought to know. But then, you can't always be sure. I'll get some boxes and start packing. The girls are pretty much packed. I think their friend is bringing a truck today. That's good. What about you? She laughed. <laughs> what about me? Well, what about me? Your safety is my job. He was a little pompous. Okay, save me. She flung out her arms. He smiled and gently slapped her elbow. The truck has come. The house is full of people, confusion, noise. I'm out near the wall. The lava touches it in places. 
intermittent snake tongues of flame reach out, shrubs fire up and fill the air with smoke. The black paws seem reluctant to climb our small wall. They puff in redness, shoot out orange and blue, then whew, collapse into darkness. The lava has its own voice. It crackles, even a roar that's becoming a tinkling sound as momentarily cooling begins. It is its own thing. I remember the first time I smelled the lava. It was the 1935 flow up between the mountains. It was cold and the air pricked my nose. Still, the lava smell was warm, like sun on rock on a hot day. The fumes were sulfuric. The cold air muted everything. Down here by the sea, the salty air mingles with the lava. Strange odors, bitter, choking, filter through the air. Mom, where are you? Harriet is bellowing. She's always had a raucous voice, deep as a man's. She's like a man, aggressive, demanding. At the same time, She's beautiful in a large sort of way, like her father, big eyes and glossy hair. She knows perfectly well where I am. There's no place to hide. She likes to yell, that's all. She is suddenly standing next to me. Her face is sweaty, her t-shirt stained with dust and grease. The outline of her breast is round and strong. Mom, Where's your stuff? You haven't even started yet. I'll get to it in my own time. Don't worry. The point is you have to follow the lava's time. It's going to burn us down. Hush, girl. I dread their rage, their resistance. Pi'ilani is just the same. They can't accept what they can't control. Your time, she snorts. We know what your time is. Well, it's your own problem. She's back in the house, and I'm alone again. <laughs> it's good being alone. I like peacefulness. Before the lava came so close, I could lie down and have a nap. No one asked if I was okay. I could sit in the chair and rock, letting images of the past swim before my eyes. I could even see the days in San Francisco before I gave up and returned to my village. For many years, I never doubted my decision. Only in these last seven years, I have. I don't understand why. Could it be that I too hate the ravaging, uncontrollable lava spoiling everything? All the changes, new plans for life, and just at a time when I want to settle down, sink a little into the green and the earth. Why should it happen? A simple technical answer, Tommy says. We're in a rift zone. Hmm. Sooner or later, there would have to be lava. <sighs> I chose village life with the possibility of a fire. I had forgotten that it was living under that earth. More than 50 years ago, I walked up and down San Francisco streets with their hard cement, cold wind plastering my clothes to me and the shadow of tall, stern buildings. In the afternoon, the fog always came in. The fog helped a little, blurring the hard rectangular edges of things. I yearn for soft air, sea change, the clatter of coconut fronds. But more than that, I yearn for people, the village people, taking things as they come, living in the moment. The day 
not always looking to the future, which, they, which would take place at an unknown time, maybe never. If they were angry, they shouted. If they loved, they hugged. If they were hungry, they ate. Of course, they didn't much like change or the strangers coming in and trying to take their land and imitate their ways. They suffered on occasion from somber melancholy. In San Francisco, I was becoming somebody else. I decided she wasn't what I wanted to be. If I had stayed there, I would be crisp, businesslike, money-minded, looking to the future. It might have been a good thing. I had a first-rate job. Everyone wondered why I suddenly resigned and went home. Who can say why now? I mean, exactly why. I did it, and that's all. Now the village for which I yearned is being devoured. And I don't have that whole other life that I never lived. And so I go round and round as I did all those years ago. There will have to be another life. What? Hey, Mom. This time it was P.E. You can't stay here until the fire strikes the house. You've got to get your stuff together. Look, P.E., the lava has almost reached the top of the wall over there by the hala tree. You remember we buried poor old Brownie under that tree. You talk like you pupuli. What are you going to what are we going to do about you? Just let me be crazy. Don't you understand the danger after all the burned houses? She muttered impatiently. You should have stayed in San Francisco. I was startled. Had she read my mind? I couldn't stop the tears. She put her arms around me. I I'm sorry, she said. What you said is good, the way the lava is good, bursting through old, forgotten blocks. It's dark. Tommy comes to tell me that only this night is left. Tomorrow is the deadline. He asks if I need help. He'd send some men. I tell him no and kiss his cheek. I can hear the lava rustling and belching along the wall. In one place, it has gone over and fat fingers reach toward the house. Darkness flames at the moments from burning gas or burning trees. I get up and put some clothes in a bag. I hunt in the dark along the shelf of artifacts for the small stone bowl, once a lamp and the small ads with the sharp edge. I hunt for the calabash my grandmother gave me. She had patched it in the old way. That's all I want. The other bowls, the poi pounders, the books, the old fishing weights can stay. The furniture can stay. The refrigerator and stove, the rugs. I want to give them all to the lava, to Pele. She wants the village. It's hers. It's always been hers. I walk around the house trying to fix myself in it forever. I, Keahi, forever in this old wooden house buried in the lava. Of course the house will burn. It won't be a house just a place where a house was. But the poi pounders might remain and the fish hooks made of bone. Most things are fragile, like this mountain slope continuously changing, like this very island with fire in its belly, with Pele. It is dawn. Samuel is standing by my bed. 
I ask him where he comes from, and he says, Australia. I don't know, ask why he was in Australia. I heard our house was going to burn. I came to get you. He pulls me from bed, puts my old robe around me. Come on, Tutu, or Tommy will be after you. We hurriedly eat some leftover poi and bits of cold fried fish. He makes steaming coffee. He opens the kitchen door wide so we can watch the lava. It has reached the oldest plumeria tree. One paw stretches toward the garage. It's an octopus, I say. Hey, Tutu, you always make fancy talk. No need wash the dishes. The lava will. Tommy Lee shouts from the front door. Hurry up, you two. Samuel takes my two small bags and ushers me toward the door. You go ahead, I say. He gives me a questioning look. I'll be coming. Don't worry. I had remembered my kukui nut necklace. Papa made it for me during his last year when the sadness settled on him and he drank all the time. He polished kukui nuts. One day, he wrapped a strand of white kukui in a tea leaf and gave it to me. It wasn't for a birthday or a celebration. He just gave it to me and shuffled off to his little room in the shed. The night I wore it when we ate, he smiled. I was 14 at the time. He died a year later. Samuel shouts from the door, I'm coming to get you. No need, I answer. I take the kukui nuts from my drawer and join the two on the lanai. Samuel puts his arms around me. His pickup truck is out there on the road. Tommy's van is there. No sign of the girls. I want to watch, I say. Okay, if you let Sam take care of you, Tommy says. They don't trust me. They have wild fantasies. I'm a mad old woman. Oh no, I whisper. I'm just keahi at the moment when my house begins to burn, and I'm still inside. I put myself inside there last night. I'm inside with all the others who have lived there. I'm inside with all the thoughts I had in San Francisco and after I came home. My life, quiet, Drifting is there, each moment of it moving into every other moment in the fire. I grip Samuel's arm. The house is incandescent with flame. Only its dark skeleton shows. The roof is crashing. The fire shouts and roars. I'm glad I left all those old things for it to have. The lava can take them away. Samuel helps me climb into the truck. The girls didn't want to watch, he says, but they knew you would want to. The house is taking a long time to go. Heavy smoke lingers, shadowing everything. It smells like smoke and rock and garbage burning. I can't feel anything. I'm empty. It's frightening. Only my eyes watch the end of the house. The rest of me is somewhere else. I turn away and put a hand on Samuel's thigh. Where are we going? Like we planned. The girls are at Auntie's waiting. I don't mean that. Samuel races the engine of his car and starts off with a lurch. Yeah, where the hell is any of us going? (laughs) 
where the hell is any of us going? That's a good segue into the next piece. Um, now we have Puanani Burgess' poem, Hawaii Ponoi. It recounts a visit to Iolani Palace and to those who once inhabited it. Kiana Rivera reads. On Friday, August 7, 1987, 43 Kanakas from Waianae in a deluxe, super-duper air-conditioned tinted glass tourist kind bus headed to Honolulu on an excursion to the palace, Iolani Palace. Racing through Waianae Ma Ilinana Kuli past Kahe Point, past at the Eva Plain. In the back of the bus, the teenagers, 35 of them, we're rapping and snapping and shouting to friends and strangers alike, hey, how's it? Check it out, going to town. Along the way, people stop and stare, wondering, what are those blahs and tittos doing in that bus? <laughs> Cousin Bozo, our driver, yes, that's his real name, spins the steering wheel, squeezing and angling that hulk of a bus through the gates made just wide enough for horses and carriages and buggies. Docent Doris greets us. Aloha mai, aloha mai, aloha mai. Only 20 per group, please. Young people, please. Deposit your gum and candy in the trash. No radios, no cameras. Quiet, please. Now, will you follow me up these steps? Helemai oko e avivi. Like a pile of fish, we rush after her. At the top of the steps, we put on soft, mauve-colored cloth coverings over our shoes and slippers to protect the precious koa wood floors from the imprint of our modern step. Through the polished koa wood doors with elegantly etched glass windows, Docent Doris ushers us into another time. Over the carefully polished floors, we glide through the darkened hallways, spinning, sniffing, turning fingers, reaching to touch something sacred, something forbidden. Quickly! Then, into the formal dining room, silent now. Table set. The finest French crystal gleaming, spoons, knives, forks laid with precision next to the gold-rimmed plates with the emblem of the king. Silent now. La Amel U. Portraits of friends of Hawaii line the dining room walls. A Napoleon, a British admiral, but no portrait of any American president. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Then, into the ballroom, where the king Kalakaua and his queen Kapi'olani and their guests waltzed, sang, laughed, and yawned in the dawn, no one daring to leave before his majesty. Now, as then, the Royal Hawaiian Band plays the Hawaiian National Anthem, and the chattering and negotiating stop. The king and his shy queen descend the center stairway, and up that same stairway we ascend, the 20 of us, encouraged at last to touch, running our hands over the core railing, we embrace our history. To the right is the queen's sunny room, a faint rustle of petticoats. To the left, we enter the king's study. Books everywhere, photographs everywhere, the smell of leather and tobacco, ink and parchment, the smell of a man at work. Electric light bulbs in the palace of a savage, can you imagine? Docent Doris tells us to be proud that electricity lit the palace before the White House. There, a telephone on the wall. Ivalani 
longs to open those books on his desk. Tony tries to read and translate the documents written in Hawaiian just lying on his desk. La'a mea u. Slowly, we leave the king and walk into the final room to be viewed on the second floor. The room is almost empty. The room is almost dark. It is a small room. It is a confining room. It is the prison room of Queen Liliu Okalani. Dosandoris tells us this is the room of Queen Liliu Okal this is the room Queen Liliu Okalani was imprisoned in for nine months after she was convicted of treason. She had only one Haole lady in waiting. She was not allowed to leave this room during that time. She was not allowed to have any visitors or communications with anyone else. She was not allowed to have any knowledge of what was happening to her Hawaii or to her people. Lili'u Okalani, ooh. I move away from the group. First, I walk to one dark corner then another, then another, pacing, pacing, searching, trying to find a point of reference, an anchor, a hole, a door, a hand, a window. My breath. I was in that room, her room in which she lived and died and composed songs for her people. It was that room in which she composed prayers to a deaf people. Oh, honest Americans, hear me for my downtrodden people. She stood with me at her window, looking out on the world that she would never rule again, looking out on the world that she would only remember in the scent of flowers, looking out on a world that once despised her. And in my left ear, she whispered, Epua, remember, this is not America, and we are not Americans. Hawaii Pono'i. Amen. Several years ago, Bamboo Ridge co founder Daryl Lum was asked to contribute a Hawaii focused piece for the award winning public radio program State of the Reunion. When the Aloha Shorts team produced a standalone show in 2014, we decided to call it From Me to You, choosing pieces in which a speaker was directly addressing one or more people. And we were happily able to program this next piece. In it, a longtime resident of Hawaii muses over the changes he has seen over the years and how he feels about them. Daryl Bonilla reads, Letter to Honolulu. Hey Honolulu, nowadays not like before. Not that before was so hard either, but I think nowadays actually stay just like before. Nowadays you're planning people working one, two, three jobs just for buy something they think they need. My mother used to tell me, no need, what for? Before time was same, people work hard for buy one house, for go mainland, cause anything mainland was better. McDonald's. Color, t uh, color TV, cause beer. We was in America. America was the Ed Sullivan real, uh, really big shoe on Sunday nights after we pow eat. One week delay. We was always one week behind. We was behind. Never going Disneyland. Never going to see snow. And now we still chasing the mainland. Broke down Sears for put on Bloomingdale's. 
They're going to broke down the farmer's market for put up $25 million penthouses. Some guys tell, how come they don't fix the stink first? Sometimes the sewer smell come up from some place, but they don't can figure out from where. That's okay, they tell. The trade winds going to blow away most times. Except when you get corner weather. The stink don't blow away. The vol come and the stink stay. My father used to go to farmer's market for buy chicken and the butcher gave him one big chicken feet for free, no stink. Hey Honolulu, we still on the plantation. Nowadays still get plenty Luna. Still get people who shame of who they are. Still get people who telling us who we are. Still get people who only see the dollars and still get us who tell, yes boss, when my Garrett say, book them Dano. Nobody on TV tell my Garrett, hey, you chasing the crook the wrong way around the island when he going airport. <laughs> hey, Wolf Fat is the name of one restaurant, not one crook. <laughs> and we give $4 million to the guys for bring one junk pro football game to the Aloha Stadium because we know more nothing better and it's good for us. Governor Burns one time, he said the problem was because we stay shame. That we don't need be shame. I know what he mean. From small kid time, we was country. No class. Primo not as good as cause. Lucky if you get an uncle work airline, he can sneak in a couple cases. McDonald's hamburger better than Chunky's because get special sauce and 100% all beef. But when you put day old bread, onions, and egg inside, come more juicy. Just like the kind that Casey drive in or Like Like. The old timers, they shake their head and say, ah, no days, not like before. They grumble, 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 and tell, ah, no can help. Progress that. But nowadays, if you don't like something, you hold sign and shout, la, 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 no can hear you. That's why I still shame. Not about outsiders or insiders. I shame that we no can say, you write, and I write. And what we gonna do? Because in the end, we live on one island. We ain't going nowhere. Nowadays, hard for see where we going because no one can see the road nighttime. Somebody went steal a copper wire. See you, Daryl. Good, right? Aloha shorts, um, good readings from everyone. Um, I guess we can open it up for questions, yeah? That, now, the great thing is we have a lot of great actors, right? Performers, yeah? Um, do you have any questions? Um, now, just go around with the microphone. Any, any? That you guys interested in? Anyone? Oh, yes, yes. Hello, my name is Susan. I wanted to find out, as you guys are sitting down, what comes to, you, to your minds to even think up a story or, or how to write it? You know, it's like, I love the fine details as you guys um, share your guys' story. I was actually watching a movie in my head, and that's what I want to write about. I want to be able to write where, the, you know, the audience like myself are able to picture and, and live through the story as if I was there. Um, how do you guys do that? I mean, what brings to mind how, how to even write that or like that? That's a really good question. And I am going to refer you to your professor because these are actors. Mm -hmm. And I'm an actor too, and we interpret what the writers put on the page. Oh, okay. And is the writer. Oh. <laughs> so you want to you want to answer that question? You're my newfound friend. I'm going to stay close to you. Oh, well, I guess, like, <laughs> well, I guess oh. <laughs> thanks. Well, I, I guess um, for the creative process like I, I know like for for my experience sometimes I write um, and I know we, we have an autobiography class and mm -hmm. uh, various classes here um, I a lot of times I recall memories right okay. um, and I uh, basically include dialogue and 
characters, you know, mm. uh, but also like I make up stories as well, right? So I, my, my, um, I guess what helps me is like when you want to tell a story, just decide what story you're passionate enough to say, mm. right, to talk about. Because yeah. like it sounds like you have a story to tell. And then you're looking for the craft uh, right. to write it down, right? Because right. I, I, it sounds like just from talking to you mm -hmm. that you have something already in mind. I have yeah. a lot. Yeah, you got a lot. <laughs> yeah. I just need to put, yeah. learn how to write it and be able to. Sure, you know, sure. And it is it together. is it in story format, yeah, or is it more poetry or? Um, I can do both. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> can, right? He's yeah. running up in this vine. Yeah, that's right, right? Because you could have like little vignettes right, and poetry right, and stuff. Right. So what I would recommend is maybe like create an outline in terms of what plot yeah of the story you want to mm. include like think of like when you want to include dialogue think of like how you know what you remember how, how they said you know what oh, they said right, you right, know because right. it's like how they did it right how they said them right, right, right. so that, that's what I would recommend to and then put that in your dialogue right to make it more real yeah right, right, right. um and just just start like writing scenes you know and then um and then Definitely, you know, you're in the right place, you know, <laughs> taking like, you know, classes, getting feedback from people. Mm -hmm. It's like, is, uh, is this scene clear or, you know, what do you recommend? And, and the great thing with actors is all the actors here, they really get into the character, right? right you know, because right. I know like poetry is like imagery and all that, but like, oh, like, you know, they, they know, like, you know, you just hear all of the different voices, yeah? They get into the characters, right? And the delivery is good, and I know they can answer questions on let that. Me, let me add something to that when you're talking about writing. All three of these pieces mm -hmm. were written by very different people, and mm -hmm. each of those three people, each of those three writers, have their own voices. Right, right. So right. what the actors did was look at the text and see what the voice of the writer was telling them. Right, right, right. You, when you're writing, you have your own distinctive voice. Right. Write down what you want to tell people. Mm. And your voice, as you, as you craft your piece, as you polish it, your voice, ideally, is mm -hmm. what will come out. Mm -hmm. Not anybody else's. Right. Yours. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? For the actors? For the actors. They're here for you. A any questions on how they get into character? Or the delivery? Yes. How many times did you have to read through the papers in order to get a feel of how you wanted to deliver the piece? I know for us, once we were given the pieces, we would meet uh, with, with Sammy, them, uh, and do rehearsals, and we'd run through it. They would give us notes, um, and then we'd get to play with it a little bit too, so we'd have a rehearsal time, sometimes one or two days. Um, Fortunately for, for us, like this piece is we got to read a little bit more than once, so we've gotten familiar with it. Um, so that's been, been a plus. But like with anything, we always work with it. And then, of course, when we're not rehearsing with them, we got to make sure we're doing the work on our own as well. So always kind of processing and trying things and, and, and just telling the story. No? Sing? <laughs> <laughs> You can uh, see that the director chooses the actor to fit the piece. So I don't know if you noticed, but Daryl is young enough to be my son. <laughs> I am the age of the narrator of this particular piece. Um, I think what is interesting in working on a piece is I put a lot of other people that I have observed in life heard, seen. Um, when I read a piece, I almost hear the voices of people that I have known. I mean, I know people like Harriet and P.E. Lani, and I know people like the main character, Keahi. And so um, what is flashing in my mind with a piece of paper is from observation of life, of your own life, and people you know, and how they sound, and what they say. I had to ask the director when I came, you weren't here. I said, how much pigeon does she speak? Because I can be as good as Daryl. <laughs> and she reminded me, she lived in San Francisco, and she was pretty hot, 
hot stuff in San Francisco, so her pigeon is not going to be heavy. So I said, see, I have to think about these things. I have to think about the character. And that's how we come to an interpretation. Um, one thing to note about these three pieces, these three actors have performed these before. So it's not a first performance in front of an audience. They've, they've done them before. You were younger, but not a lot younger. We were all younger. <laughs> we were, they were all younger. And age helps. I know you don't believe in me now, but age does help. Because these pieces are all richer, I think than they were when they were first performed. Mm. Um, yes, and I think every time we rehearse and every time we read the piece again and visit, revisit, um, we're always discovering something new yes. within the text. Um, we're always seeing their world a little bit more differently. Um, so it helps to just read over and over out loud. It makes a huge difference. Oh, 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 yes, oh, yes. Do you have a question? Yeah, just a little question. Um, uh, when you uh, prepare a performance, do you uh, discuss with writers or do you take their advices or? For, um, for these shows, no. We wanted to approach the pieces on the merits of the words alone. Um, that's not always the usual practice with theater. With theater, I'm a theater director. If the playwright is alive and available to me, I'll ask her if I have questions, and I will include her in the process. But for these, we were going straight from the text. Um, we loved having the, the writers in the audiences, though, mm -hmm. to hear it. <laughs> and you had a question? piece once. I did a Daryl Lum piece once without having him have any input. And he came and sat in the audience and went, wow, that was great. I didn't think about it like that. Hmm. So sometimes uh, the writers themselves are not always so precious about things. They're very um, gentle with the actors. <laughs> They're really good to us, yeah. Good question. Oh, I see there's another question. Yes. Okay, so question to the actors. Um, have you guys ever written your own autobiographical piece and was it performed by you or anybody else or somebody else? Yes. Um, <laughs> I've written plays, two plays that were semi autobiographical. Um, and it was performed by other people. I think I. As a playwright, I like that escape. I like that separation because it's so personal to have someone else perform that personal piece. Define semi-autobiographical, though. <laughs> semi? Uh, mm. It's based a lot on my life, but the details change. And I, I actually wrote some pieces um, for Honolulu Theater for Youth. They do. They used to do uh, a Christmas talk story, which is based on stories of holiday themes or stuff like that. So I got to write uh, three, three pieces throughout the years for them. That uh, and one of them I got to perform, and it was all based on my childhood experiences on Christmas and the holidays. And so, but just like with Kiki, like it was kind of fun to like to write. I was super nervous watching it for the first time. And just seeing my words and seeing how the audience would respond to the story, if they even would get it or anything like that. So, so I remember the first time being very nerve-wracking. Uh, the second time I was performing it, so I didn't really get to think of it as a writer because I was thinking of it as a performer and just performing. But what was interesting was having the director find stuff in my writing that I didn't know was there. And that's always kind of fun to see and watch them too. And that's the process that you get to watch. And, and so, and then the third piece <coughs> I got to watch, and that one, since that was like my third time, I just kind of got to sit back and enjoy it, and and really just enjoy the process and just watch. So, so it's always a, 
fun out of body experience when you when you see your your piece come to life on, on stage you know so yeah i have a question uh, i know we have a uh, actor and director collaboration i was wondering how, how did uh, all of you work it out in terms of the delivery of the pieces an actor yeah it was them, yeah. They're. We, as, as directors, I think we, we cast well, which means we chose the actors we knew would have some connection to the literature, some connection to the, the writing. Um, it may be something as mundane as being from the place that, that the, the writer talks about, or it, it may be just the spirit of the actor connects with what we think is the text. But um, yeah, if you cast good actors, that's like 90% of it because they're bringing so much to the work. They're bringing so much to the table that you can together, this is, okay, this is my point of view as a director. Together you collaborate on building the piece maybe going a little bit this way, and then the actor will say, well, what about this? Oh, let's go there, and then see how that all combines. Um, it's a process. Yeah. I just want to say to that, um, I forget already, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no, you sure? Yeah, no, I don't want to. I, I got another question. Do you folks pick your own pieces, what you guys are going to act and talk about? Or somebody picks it for you folks? You, you know what I mean? Oh, now she knows. Yeah, assigned. Because it's also related to that. Uh, oh, perfect. That, uh, we've, well, I know, yeah, we've all worked with Sammy for a really long time. And so we already have that relationship with her and that trust mm -hmm. that not a lot of actors and directors have, especially if they're new. And so when I go into a rehearsal, like when Sammy asks me to do a piece, I know that she chose this oh. specifically for my voice. Okay. And so I already have an idea of where she wants to go oh. with it. And so I think that has that, mm -hmm. that relationship right. has a lot to do with are this very are unique you able, situation. Are you able to pick your own pieces or, you know? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, for for this format, no, because mm -hmm. um, the co-producers, uh, the three of us, mm -hmm. um, chose the pieces we wanted to present in particular radio shows mm -hmm. or for uh, the anthology. Mm -hmm. um, in so for those those, the book, the shows, we cast the actors for specific pieces. However, if you are a solo performer, then you can. You can you can produce your own show and pick what you want to do. Nyla does a slightly different kind of performance, so she can she can attest to this. I have been a solo performer for fifty years, so um, it's a mix. I choose my own pieces. I write my own pieces. Some of them are autobiographical. Some of them are other people's pieces. The the smart performer performs calls up. So sometimes I will tell S S Sammy, can you listen to this? Tell me, do I have the right take on this? It's always good to have an outsider mm -hmm. listen to you, mm -hmm. especially when you perform solo. And I've performed uh, all over the mainland. The hardest part of performing in the mainland is when to do the pigeon. Right. It's really kind of interesting when you do a pigeon piece on the mainland and you have to do translation instantly. Mm. Or Hawaiian pieces on the mainland and I'm saying the words and translating at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it helps always performer writers to bring in an outside eye, to have somebody else watch you. You have what you want in your head right. and sometimes it's not as clear. Right, right. Other, She's really, I love working with her. I love working with Sammy. Even if it's my own pieces, right. I love working with her. Yeah. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Right here. Oh. <laughs> did, did you have I don't like talking too much in this microphone. Okay, so um, going back to like performing your pigeon pieces on the mainland, um, what kind of reactions do you usually get from mainlanders regarding like pigeon and Hawaiian? Is it kind of like, what is she talking about? Or more, um, like, wow, that's so cool. Like, what's the reaction to it? Wait, to hear me, Abe? <laughs> <laughs> what's the reaction to um, pigeon from, on the mainland? From, yeah, from IOC on the mainland. I tell a really deep pigeon story that I wrote, really deep. I mean, it's like rap, rap lunger. <laughs> and I told it to a ladies' um, a fine arts group in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. Okay. And they loved it. None of them speak pigeon. But if you perform well enough with all the movement and you ought to see Daryl move, man. The guy moves. <laughs> you know, pigeon is more than the la the words, yeah? Right. There's a uh, physicality to pigeon, right? There's physicality. Um I had more cheers from this very refined group of fine arts ladies than anywhere I have had at home because they had never heard it. It was so exotic. And the storyline story was simple, so the language could be deep in pidgin. You know? It's called Grinds, Grinds, De All Minds, <laughs> by the way. Oh, good questions, yes. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.